is really, I just finished writing a new chapter for a new book that I'm writing called The Loving Bond. And uh, I love all of my animals. Yesterday I felt like a cheap date for those of you that were there. I was hustling all the, the dogs in, in the hall. And, and uh, that's something that's uh, important to me. I really have fallen in love with animals. So we'll, you'll find out later on today that I never had, I didn't have an animal, a dog, until I was an adult. And in fact, I am a perfect example. I should be a poster child for a humane society because I have never, not only did I not have animals, I was afraid of them. And so, from a person that was afraid of having animals and becoming a Dr. Doolittle, um, I've gone through a tremendous transformation. And we'll talk about that. So let me just tell you the story about Peter who you're going to see a couple of times. And it's nice to see her. I haven't seen her in a few months. Um, PJ um, was a dog that I got many years ago. Uh, the book, Afternoons with Puppy, the reason I named that book after the news with puppy uh, comes from it just went to sleep again. So we're gonna have to, you're going to fiddle away. Sorry about this. Now I really am going to have to talk. Hopefully we won't have to play fiddle on the roof all day long. Otherwise I'll just do this without slides. But, but the long story short was puppy was an abused golden retriever. We had a chance to meet her. And she was my first therapy dog. Although I had been using this to find out therapy animals for close to 35 years. Probably a little longer than that. Although I'm only 20. Um, <laughs> the long story short was after Puppy died, um, we actually had a couple of dogs, and I didn't want any of the dogs. I really didn't. But, um, and in fact, I had people, breeders throughout the country, that said, I'll give you a free golden retriever. And I said, no, I, I just, I'm not ready for a dog. I have a couple that I love, and I'm not ready to go through this all over again. But my, my boys were stubborn. My oldest boy is 29 now. My youngest one is 26. I keep it with them because my oldest boy is 6 foot 6. I let him know that genetics will change as he, he's an athlete. And my little one is 6 foot 1. They're a wonderful boy. Um, about 11 years ago, um, they decided to give me a gift during the holidays. They said, Dad, we got a gift for you. It was in an envelope. It was in an envelope. What kind of gift is this? And then, of course, the typical gift they usually get and there's nothing in the envelope. <laughs> but there was a note, and it said, Dad, we got you a gift. But the gift's not here yet. Because we know you, and we wanted your golden smile back. And so, if you want, we actually have a dog, but it's not even born yet. Because we know you, and you'd like to go through the whole product. Uh, the whole process of pregnancy. In fact, that's why I am the way I am today. When we had my firstborn son, my wife said, let's eat. And I said, when, where, and how? And after she had the baby, I just kept on going. So I played it on her to see how men dealt with the system. But anyways, they gave me the, this wonderful, wonderful gift. And um, so I went to visit the mom for weeks. Every Sunday I would go visit the mom and we hang out. And the lady liked me a lot. She said, well, you can choose any dog you want. And then there was a dog, and that was her. And her name at that time was Miss Red. She had a red yarn that was pink. They were pink, those green. I fell in love with Miss Red. And in fact, I put pictures in my office because I said, one day Miss Red was going to be a new therapy dog. I didn't know when. And actually, this dog was a dog that I actually decided to let my patients name. Since then, I've let my patients name two other of my therapy animals. And so I got lots of names. I got names like Hope and Jubilee and funny names. But I never forgot one boy. He sent me a note. And he put it in the box and he said, You know, Dr. Fine, I'm really at the end of all of my therapy. But you know, when I came to visit you, Puppy was such an inspiration to me. I know we can't bring her back. But why don't you name the new dog in her honor. Not that she's going to fill those paws, but that you'll always remember who she was. And so the new dog ended up being called Puppy Junior, or PJ. Aww. So PJ lived a long life, um, a little bit shorter than I wished. Uh, she died very, very quickly. She, um, I recognized that she wasn't doing well. She had just had a physical two and a half weeks before that everything was fine, um, except they didn't check deep enough, I guess. And uh, I knew this, that she wasn't going, doing as well as she needed, so we brought her to the vet. And we ended up finding out 
that her spleen was gone. Um, she had a large tumor, her kidney was shutting down. She had 12% of her blood in her system. But she was a trooper, a trooper. So we said our goodbyes, and, and uh, maybe later on we'll talk about that. Um, and you'll, you'll be Kleenex throughout the day today, because I like to tell these kinds of stories. But these are special buddies, and I learned a long time ago that when you give a dog your heart, and that's what that little children's book is, I don't know where it is back there. When you give a dog your heart, or a cat or a kitten, uh, a bird, a lizard, uh, love will come your way. You can't be afraid of that. You can't be afraid of loving. Uh, the hard part about loving um, our companion animals is that their lives are much shorter than ours. And that's a cheat, but I wouldn't miss it for a moment. And I go through these feelings periodically, and people say, how do you do it? In this new chapter, I've written, I've written a couple on um, the death of a pet. And so, uh, these are just on his feelings. So that's PJ. And what I'd like to do to get started, see, so I brought my own PJ because I wasn't, I got a oh, coming from the north, but I'm going to steal your spark soon. I woke up and it'll, it'll go. That's it. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I was here, Leo Bustan and, and Boris Levinson, uh, many years ago, were some people that began to coin this term. Um, in talking to people, you know, where did this word come from? And in many ways, the word came from um, our work with children and parents. When you think of human-child interactions, you think of this tremendous bond, this tremendous um, connection that we have. And that's how this word actually came into vogue, that people began to say, is there, is there another connection that we really can realistically say and one of the challenges that we're going to talk a bit today about is the fact that I, I really wonder as we grow as a field how much of what we're talking about is misunderstood. Because scientists are very interested in trying to discover is there an inherent benefit. We're going to talk about some of these benefits today. But for some people, they really don't care. They really don't care about that having a dog will change your cardiovascular system or having a dog will change neurotransmitters that I'm going to explain in a couple of minutes. Because they say, I just like to be with my pets. I work for Dog Fancy. How many of you have ever read that magazine? I had a column for Dog Fancy for a while and, and um, we talked a little bit about that notion that what is it about our connection with animals that works? So I always like that picture that you're seeing um, in Paris with a little boy and his dog. You see that quite frequently uh, with animals in cafes. But if I was going to ask you, why do you have that people giggle at that picture and I just think it's a loving puppy on someone's lap? Well, let me ask you the question. Why do you have um, pet animals or pets anyway? Join me a little bit. It's just the joy. It's the joy. What else? There's that interaction, that intuition that, an animal, that, that your pet companion provides you. What else? Unconditional love. And I love that, except it's interesting. You know, when I, when I witness puppy, well, you'll get to meet her in a few minutes. Um, I didn't bring videos of my animals, but, but I actually they've been on, on television. Um, puppy, when you saw her, it didn't take very long for you to say what's with her mouth, because you saw her teeth were knocked down because of her early experience when she was uh, abused. But, but in essence, and I always wondered how she would have like a second chance, which is um, something that I believe in. But definitely this unconditional love, that in fact, when you think about it, um, animals are, are much more accepting of us, and we'll talk about why that is. Anyone else have another reason? How many of you have dogs raise your hands? How many of you have cats? Okay. Um, how many of you have dogs and cats? So we have a large family. Um, how many of you have birds? Okay, what kind of birds do you have? Parakeets. I have cockatoos, and I have lovebirds, and I have conures. I just have lots and lots of animals. When I say I used to, that's the hard part about my work. You know, when kids come to visit me, they go, so how is this one or that one? And, you know, these kids are now like 30 years old, and I still call them kids, and, and I go, well, she's no longer with us. And so over the years, at one time I had uh, um, so many birds, some of the birds I may have um, and um, allow other people to adopt them that I think would be a good 
good families. But I have cockatoos, conures. Conures are wonderful, wonderful animals to work with, especially duskies. Sometimes conures are a little bit loud, and so you have to, but duskies aren't as much. How many of you have this um, reptiles? Many of you have reptiles? And, 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 and I have a reptile too. You know what I mean? The first, uh, I am, I am. You know, in fact, um, I, I used to be afraid of them too, but I never forgot um, a vet called me. A, we had a, a bearded dragon that was tiny and, and said, Would you mind adopting her because we're going to have to put her down because her tail was cut off? I oh, yeah, well, it's small. And so I'll give you the, uh, I'll give you the terrarium for it and, and I'll get you all started. I go, Sure, why not? And a couple weeks later, you know, after I got her settled and she was really comfortable, a boy came in and goes, Man, Dr. Fine, you like lizards? <laughs> oh, I have a beardy dragon too. Would you mind if I brought her in? I go, Sure, why not? Next week, bring the bearded dragon in. So he comes in a few weeks later. And I forgot, you know, you get old, you forget something, you remember everyone's name, you, you, you make sure you don't forget, but he comes in with this big box. <laughs> like the staple boxes that you have stationed to get the paper in. I forgot, I don't know what he's doing, he's moving in the box, giving me paper, what do I know? So he comes in, he's talking, he's a big smile on his face, and he finally says to me, Do you want to meet my lizard? And I'm like, What was with the lizard? The big box is this big, right? He takes out the bearded dragon, it looked like Godzilla to me. <laughs> And I turned white like a ghost. And, and he said, I guess you didn't know they grow big, did you? <laughs> but this, this, this lizard actually lived with me for 12 years. She lived a long, long time. And in fact, they don't usually live that long. Um, one of the things you'll find out is that I use animals in a variety of ways. This lizard um, had chronic constipation often. And so, when I treat lots of children for a variety of reasons, any child that I treated for encopresis, which is a soiling disorder, um, I would always introduce them to spiky. And it was an easy way of talking about bathroom problems, because um, this, her constipation issues were frequent, so I would either give her oils and, and to get her to go to the bathroom, or something, just put them in a, in a warm um, bowl of water, and you rub their backs and, and then they go to the bathroom. And so kids see that and they say, gee, yes, there she has a pooping problem. And then all of a sudden it's easy for kids to talk about. The other reason, of course, Spiky and some of the other animals, and this is not something that I that I that I love to talk about, but you know, some of the children that I have dealt with have been victims of abuse. You know, it was very apparent when you saw Spike and her tail, because they don't grow back. We would talk about the, the meanness of people and children then would, would associate. She was a wonderful, wonderful lizard, actually. So when we talk about that, um, my wife was a little ambivalent of lizards, and, but she's still, she's wonderful, and I, I'll be teasing her a little bit, sorry. Um, but, but, but the reality is, um, she's always a great sport, she'll feed the lizards, and probably the reason why Spike lives so long is because of the children, in fact, because not only, does, you know, many people give lizards crickets or, or, or mealworms, sometimes they'll give them pinkies, which I never did. She was a vegetarian most most of most of her life. We mix it up with crickets periodically, but because I fed her a lot of vegetables, um, it didn't blow out the proteins that she brought in weren't as high, and so it helped her system a bit more. But she, as she grew up, she was wonderful. We put her on a on, on a towel and she would sit, you had to see what my office looked like. She would be something, periodically again, I had to keep her warm. She would sit on the table and in a little blanket. Kids would say hello to her. I had a cockatoo sitting on the chair. And I had anywhere from one to four dogs surrounding us. And you wonder, what's it like to come into Dr. Vine's office? In those days, you'd have a golden retriever coming on up and sort of working the crowd. And then you'd have the cockatoo walking down the aisle <laughs> saying, come on back. <laughs> different kind of world. So let's just talk a little bit about the benefits of pet ownership. And many of you have heard about these physiological benefits. Uh, Aaron Katcher and Erica Friedman and a gentleman named Dr. Lynch uh, serendipitously um, had a discovery. And basically I'm going to give you a backstory that many of you may not know. Lynch was actually a student of, of a gentleman that was the last living student of Pavlov. Many of you, if you've ever heard of Pavlov, recognize that he was doing work with 
dogs and doing something called classical conditioning. The hard part with classical conditioning is that it made dogs, in my opinion, somewhat anxious. And so what Lynch's mentor did is that he would often go back and pet the dogs. Just to say hello because he liked dogs and on their break time. And what did he find out? He found out that when you pet the dog, the dog relaxed. Made it a bit more comfortable. And so then they wondered, would that make a difference for humans? And so about 1978, that was when that first discovery, that first study came out, where they found that petting dogs, very comforting dogs, made you feel more at ease. And you found cardiovascular changes. That's been replicated for years, as you well know. That's actually PJ Emmett. I've been a sort of like a family album. I feel like I'm at home. I should just sit down in my pajamas and tell you pictures. And those of you that saw that little button I was wearing yesterday, yes. that was the picture that it's from. So you can recognize that it has those ears. Anyways, so number one, the thing that we found, and then nowhere to tell the stories like that. Um, cardiovascular, lowering blood pressure has been looked at in a variety of areas. We found now that it doesn't only work with, with dogs in uh, comforting dogs, in, in with people that have had heart attacks, but also works in the work setting where you can find that dogs can reduce stress. I did a study where I brought one of my therapy dogs to my college class, a large class, because I felt that I wanted to change the environment a bit. At first I didn't know if this was going to work because puppy actually was, I was probably her assistant and the other way around. She, when she came to the college classes, she had to make sure she said hello to everybody. So at first I said, this isn't going to work, there's 120 students, I'll never get to lecture. But then she sort of looked at me and goes, don't worry about it, I'll be quiet. And she'd go up and down the aisle, slap your nose, and then after that, she would just sit in the front of the class like the dog in mom. She would sit there like that, or Carl Rogers, and you'll see that when she had her, 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 her boss crossed, very calm. And you had to see how these students just relax, especially during exam times. It changed the whole environment. And so one of the things that we have recognized, many of you know what cortisol is, that's a stress hormone. Lots of research has demonstrated that being around a friendly animal can reduce cortisol levels in humans. Um, I'm doing, hopefully, a study of the children with autism, and we're going to be working on some academic behaviors. But one of the reasons we're bringing in the dogs, not only to do what many of you have heard of reading dogs, but we're also bringing in the dogs to look at the reduction of stress because we want the kids more ready to learn. So the cortisol is a very easy piece of evidence to collect. Um, you can take it from saliva, and so we're doing it that way. The other thing, of course, that was found um, several years ago uh, by a gentleman named Odenthal, now this has been replicated many, many times, is that petting an animal, specifically dogs, though, we haven't really done a lot of work with other animals, um, can increase oxytocin and serotonin. How many of you know what oxytocin is? So if you don't, I'll tell you what it is. Because um, many of you are women here. Um, when you breastfeed, oxytocin level goes up. And, and in many ways, when you think about it, when many women breastfeed, they, they, they feel that loving bond. How many of you remember when you first got a puppy? And you had those puppy, you know, electric, Figures you saw like a shiny. Do you remember those days? I see them every day with my wife. You see that, honey? I'm really working here. Um, you know, but in essence, I have those feelings all the time. It's true. I, I, I am blessed to, to, to be with my wife. She's my best friend. And uh, her and my dog, it's like you wake up every morning and you get happy. Um, but in essence, oxytocin is the love. So you see with women, when they breastfeed, you know when oxytocin also goes up a lot? When women childbirth, when you give birth to a child, when you think about it, many women would agree childbirth is, is not such a fun experience at the end. You know, it, it hurts a little bit, right? You know, I didn't know that. In fact, when we had our first son, you know how stupid we were. There were, you know, I have a doctorate and my wife has a master's degree. She had her first contraction. So we run to the hospital right away and they go, lady, it's, you're, 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 you're only two. You need to get to ten. And then I said to her, you know, honey, you can't go to bed because maybe you'll miss it. And maybe you'll miss the whole experience. Let me tell you, by the time she was hitting the bullseye number, I was supposed to teach her deep breathing and get into 
laughed at us a little, looked at my nice blue eyes. She was yelling and screaming at me. Anything I was trying to do didn't work. But the reality is, why oxytocin level goes up is that, in fact, we ask women, and it's an interesting point, what do they remember the most about giving birth? It seemed to be. Yeah. And that's when the oxytocin is at its highest level. That's what we're really talking about. One of the physiological benefits now is to really look at oxytocin, serotonin, um, these neurotransmitters changing as a consequence of being surrounded by um, common animals. On the other hand, so one of the ways to understand this is that petting an animal is almost like having a biological spot treatment. Um, that's one of the things that many uh, that are in the industry are looking at in regards to how you sell the, the position you know, that people should have pets. Um, but again, I, I still think when I talk to mainstream people, mainstream people say, yeah, this is all good, and I'm happy to hear this, but the reality is we have animals that are less than we just love them. These are great secondary benefits. You know, when you look at physiological benefits, how many times do you hear the fact that people have dogs because it encourages you to walk more? You know what I mean? We hear about this with the elderly. My dogs on a typical day walk anywhere from seven to nine times. Okay, because I do a lot of walking with my, my patients. They're going to look like it. But there, I make sure that they're really well exercised. And it's really funny because sometimes people say, oh, you know, we can't run our dogs that, that much. The reality is the big dogs that I have, I could never run them to the level that their bodies can handle. So the reality is sometimes many people actually exercise. And one of the wonderful excuses that we have is having our animal to help us, especially the elderly. I don't know if any of you do any work with the elderly. The reality is that's a wonderful gift because the reality is um, one of the things that we found when we're looking at some of the psychosocial benefits of having animals, as well as the physiological benefits, um, dogs and dog walking are good, except we have to look at the fact that not all species of animals are viable for certain folks. And that's why it becomes like almost what I call the Baskin Robbins philosophy. The reality is um, there are different choices for different people. You know, I know at some point in my life I probably won't be the best um, companion for a golden retriever or a lab because I owe it to them to do all these things that I do. On the other hand, smaller dogs that may not need as much exercise or perhaps cats that are much more sedentary and more independent may be better choices for me later on. But what we find with the elderly and there's been a lot of research on this, is that many of them use the animal as an excuse to go out. You know, one of the, the, the most interesting studies, and, and as I, I um, switch to the psychological benefits, I, I think about the fact that with one of the most interesting parts with the elderly has been that older people say that having an animal in their life gives them a sense of purpose. And that sense of purpose allows them to move forward. And the interesting part, and it was a study done about 15 years ago, that looked at the fact that older people spend more time talking about today, living today, when they have a pet in their life, versus spending time talking about yesterday. And I think that's a very healthy position. You find, you know, there's been some research that has demonstrated that, um, Older individuals that have pets in their lives seem to complain less about um, acute challenges like arthritis and pains. They just seem to live through it. How many of you have ever seen a film called Dancing with the White Dog? It's one of my favorite films. I, I use it or show it periodically um, in a class. But the reality is what a wonderful, wonderful film. It was made by Hallmark. And it's about, it has Jessica Tandy and Hugh Crone, and it actually has a, a Aussie Shepherd, a white Aussie Shepherd, which is um, an interesting um, color. Usually those dogs turn deaf, this dog didn't. The reality is, the film, without giving it away, has uh, Jessica and Hugh, who actually are really, they were actually a married couple. In the film, Jessica dies. He battles with this. But then he finds this dog 
that seems to change his life, and his family thinks that he is making this up, that it's a, uh, a figment of his imagination. Because he talks about the dog, and the dog isn't seen. But the family eventually meets him. One of the, the most beautiful scenes in that film is when he comes back from the hospital because he was ill. He dances with her. He says, let's dance. That's where the name of the film comes. But I recall, I'm not going to give you the end of the story because I, I want you to see it. Uh, there's just a lovely scene where he lies in the bed and he looks at the dog. And you know what he says? He says, thank you. Thank you for making my days better. You know, I say thank you to my animals all the time. Thank you for just being here. Uh, sometimes I don't exactly want to thank them when they get the mischief. But I thank them for the joy that I have. You know, it's really interesting. I rarely get frustrated with, with my companions, even when they have gotten into mischief big time. Big time. And I can tell you stories about the part later on. But anyways, psychological benefits of elderly. In fact, one of the first studies that looked at animal assisted interventions, and I'm not really boring you with names of people, but if you want the data and the studies, I can give you who they are. Um, actually took place in England with budgies, actually. So the parakeets. And basically, they found that having parakeets in a unit for the elderly actually enhanced the quality of life in that living environment. And that was really one of the first studies. But psychosocial benefits, of course, um, we can look at um, some of the work that looks at decreasing depression and stress. Again, part of that is that real physiological benefit. Later on, I'm going to tell you some stories of some of my patients that are depressed and how I've used the animals. The reality is, um, it almost is like cheers, those of you that remember that little comment yesterday. It's like everybody knows your name, you know what I mean? When, a, when an animal comes up, you know, I won't nuzzle next to you, but <laughs> kind of fun, actually. But anyways, you know, what's it like when an animal comes over and, and leans on you and makes you feel good, doesn't it? And it, forget all the biological reasons, it, it, it really makes you feel wanted. It's like when I come home, when I used to come home, Lots of animals. It was like the Calvary Stampede. It really was. <laughs> they would run to the door and sparking. And the, it's interesting. My cockatoo is more observant than the dogs are sometimes there snoozing. And she's screaming, He's home! He's home! God! <laughs> and as I say, my wife just looks, Sit down. You're not as important. But, but the reality is, that's an important issue to recognize. So, in reality, we have seen lots and lots of studies. One of the things we find is, of course, animals increase social and emotional support. And we'll talk about that as one of the theories of why people enjoy being with animals. In fact, we enjoy being with animals because they enhance our relationships, enhance our abilities to interact. They become a conduit. Those of you that ever walk your animals, how many people ever stop you and say, can I ever pet your dog? Or, dog, remember I'm the cheap little sucker that I'll walk, run across the street and say, can I kiss your dog? <laughs> Because, and, and, and you know, one time I was with my cousin in Vancouver, Vancouver, Canada, uh, I was there for the Olympics, and, and I saw this beautiful golden retriever with this young lady, and I really wanted to interact with the dog. My, son's, my cousin said to me, don't you think that you're trying to pick her up? I'm like, no, I just want to talk to the dog. So the reality is, it acts as a social catalyst. We'll talk about that and how, of course, we use this therapeutically. Um, how many people are lonely and find themselves in dog groups, or they go to the dog park and, and they find themselves meeting others. And, and I think this is all important. But we do need to think of the animal side, because sometimes we need to make a contract with animals. And that is, we don't do this only when you're puppies and kittens and you look cute. We have to make the commitment that it's a lifetime commitment. And I think of a story that I heard many years ago um, about a woman who had a dog that was her husband's dog and she didn't um, really like the dog a lot. But when the husband died, she said, I'm going to keep the dog. And, and she kept the dog and, and uh, they became good, fast buddies. She went to a dog park and she interacted. But then, unfortunately, she met another man. And then what happened? She forgot about the dog. And so we need to make a contract with animals that's a real commitment. A real commitment that even when you're dead tired, when you're dead tired, and we'll talk about dogs, not as much cats, um, but, but the reality is you, 
You need to take that obligation seriously. And, and that's why we see so many animals getting abandoned. Um, because people sort of say they were cute when I thought of it. That's why birds, the, the large birds that I work with, um, they, they're really intriguing. But it's a major commitment. And these birds that I have traditionally can live for 80 years. I have a cockatoo that's 27 years old already. And she's grown up with my kids. So the reality is you have to respect that issue. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about animal welfare. So again, um, we can look at the fact that having an animal in a life increases empathy. Um, it enhances social skills. You have to learn how to relate in a different way. It can increase patience. Um, and it is a wonderful opportunity for social interaction. When we talk more about animal assisted therapy, I'll talk a bit about that. OK, so we'll go back again. We're going to take another look at an example. Sometimes having an animal in your life is just really fun. They laugh at us, and we laugh at them. And I think that that's another reason why. And I think of all the joy and the funny things that, 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 that we see. Okay. Um, and for some people, it's really a reason to live in. Those of you that were here yesterday heard a little bit of the story, so I, I hope this won't uh, um, bore you. Um, this is one of my, my favorite stories. It's actually not about a dog of my own. I, I feel like I've known Gleason for years. And he's an Oregon dog. So I feel I had to talk about Oregon. Am I saying that right? Oregon. I'm not saying it right. right? So, Oregon. 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 I got to say it like a, I got to put that accent on Oregon. Okay. So he's not Canadian. So we speak all of these things. We speak about We speak real English. We speak American. Um, but Gleason, when, when I actually uh, wrote Afternoons with Puppy, um, I, I wrote the book because Puppy wasn't really my first at therapy ever. She was my first therapy dog. And, and the book isn't about puppies, it's about lots of stories. But the one thing that's consistent, it was called Afternoons with Puppy. The reason why it's afternoons is uh, in the morning I'm a college professor, sometimes in the morning I'm a psychologist. But every afternoon I always work clinically with children. Ergo, afternoons with my therapy animals, with my co therapists. And so most of Afternoons with Puppy is really about me. It's, it's really what it was like to, to be a therapist that's been doing this for over 30 years. And um, it's very much a soft, written book that, that really looks at insights about patients, about people, about life through the eyes of the companionship of animals. But when I wrote this book, I actually put an announcement out because I wanted to get lots of other stories. And I probably got about 110 different uh, stories from all around the world, of which I've used a few of them in there. But Gleason really impressed me. And in fact, the story of Gleason and Alexand became its own chapter. The chapter was called Cardium. So let me tell you a little bit about my friend Gleason, who just died a couple of years ago. I had wished I could have met Sue, but she's, I didn't realize how big Oregon is. Oregon is and it's, uh, she's about four hours away from here. But what I was told was, this was in 2001, so about 10 years ago, um, Gleason and Sue were uh, walking uh, in a children's hospital, and uh, here she was, and all of a sudden she heard a little girl shout, I like dogs, can, can he come and visit me too? And he's a big boy, he's a pet partner, so that's one of yours. And he walked into the hospital, into her room, and they cuddled, and many of you that have done these visits kind of know the story. And every time Gleason came in, they became fast friends. And in fact, there were times that Gleason would even visit Alexan in her home. One time, Sue said, around Valentine's Day, would it be okay if I took Alexan and Gleason to her ceramic shop? I said, to make some. She wanted to make a gift for the mom and dad. So they went, and um, Alex had put on a wig, put on a baseball cap, and off they went. And as they went into the shop, some people, some of the kids actually stopped and said, what's with the dog? You know, dogs don't usually come into ceramic shops. So some of the kids walked over to the table where she and Sue and Gleason were, 
They kept on asking these questions. She's a little girl. You know, how to catch your dog in here? I'd like to do that. And, 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 and is it your dog? And, and, and she didn't know what to say. She kept on looking at Sue. She was a little shy. And finally she said, he isn't my dog. You know, he's my best friend. Let me tell you. She took off the cap. She took off her wig. She said, I had something called cancer. I don't know exactly how to explain this to you. Kids said, who cares about cancer? The dog's cool. <laughs> Can we sit at your table and make our ceramic pieces? So that was a wonderful day for her. But I wish I could tell you all these stories are, are beautiful endings. There was a time that she had to get her leg amputated. And she wanted Lisa to come along. And Lisa couldn't go. And she really wanted him. But they packed along a stuff Lisa, so to speak. I can tell you other stories, but what I can tell you is the last time Lisa saw her, he wasn't the best big boy, actually. Because he didn't want to leave. So he couldn't understand why she said, Lisa, we've got to go. I know we all get uptight. One of the things I'm going to talk about is sometimes I let my animals do lots of things if I understand what they're trying to lead me to. So we work as co-therapists sometimes. And Lisa just wanted to hang out. Five hours later, phone rang after they went home and Alexander died. When he saw Sue the handler cry, and this is the truth, he howled for two hours. She had never seen him do that ever again. The picture that you see in front of you is the picture that was on the pew of the church. And you know what was really neat while there were balloons at the, the memorial service? There was a special spot in the front of the church. For Gleason and there we go. And he went to that service. And he had a new job. So that's the story of Gleason. And for some people, you'll find it really is a source of living. And I can tell you about some of my patients that I will in a little while. I thought that since I've been born in, I, I could show you these two pictures. This is Gleason at the end of his life. And probably I found out that Gleason was the dog of the year in 2005 for your state. And he's on the cover of um, their uh, medical directory. A little snow, I suppose. <laughs> but his snow's here too. Very good. So that's what he's in. So global acceptance of animals. 90% um, of people today some call their animals, especially in Western society, um, family members. How many of you call yourself mummies and dads? <laughs> now, let me be open. <laughs> I'm videotaping, so. Um, <laughs> how many of you talk baby talk to your animals? You know, it's interesting because I would never ad admit that I've done that. You know, <laughs> there have been articles that talk about it, I'll explain why it's called mother ease. Mother ease is the technical term that we sometimes say when we use baby talk. And, and, and we're going to explain why that happens because many of us feel like we're the guardians. Now, some of you, how many of you have pictures of your animals? On yourself. Look at this. Okay. Um, yeah. Honey, which goes, yes. You know, I have a picture of my wife on my phone. She's sort of buried below the dogs, but she is there too. But the reality is, when you talk about this, in many ways, so many of us feel so connected to our animals. I never forgot, I did a television show, um, uh, a good morning show in, in Los Angeles, a very large audience. And I couldn't believe this because there I was. Talking and the lady, we got into this whole baby talk issue, and she says, Do you ever talk baby talk? And I go, Well, you know, I had my college voice on. And I go, Well, uh, you know, sometimes I do. And she said, Well, would you demonstrate how you do this? <laughs> no way, no, this is not. And by the time the conversation ended, all of a sudden they go, No, no, baby, go on, love you, baby kids. And so she's got a giggle of this. Well, how many of us have birthday celebrations for our pets? Many of us do this. Again, this is a new phenomenon. As Marty Becker said, from the backyard to the bedroom, we have brought our animals into our lives. And so acceptance is different, again, from a Western society, but this isn't always for the way everyone looks at animals. And I've met people in my quest to understand the human-animal relationship. I've gone to Africa. I've gone to the North Pole to watch people go to see polar bears. 
um, to try to understand. And then I've gone to other parts of the world where people love their animals, but very differently. I've seen people that, that, that use livestock, but they're very caring to their animals, so they may not invite them into their bedrooms or their, into the house, but they're very caring. We call this anthropomorphic thinking when we start doing this. And I want to explain two things. Anthropomorphic thinking isn't only about animals. We do this with other things. Like how many of you have ever got mad at your computer and you're going, the computer's killing you today. She's really trying to kill you. And therefore you're anthropomorphizing the computer. Sometimes I'll be gendered with men and their cars. Did you see my baby? You know what I mean? They talk about their cars like, again, they're human. Why is anthropomorphic thinking bad? It's only bad from one scientific standpoint because, number one, we shouldn't be humanizing features because, again, I think that is a weakness. Our companion animals, we're animals too, we happen to be humans. Dogs are canines, cats are felines. They're not humans. But that doesn't mean they, have, they, they don't have feelings and emotions and thoughts because there's been a lot of research on this. Anthropomorphic thinking sometimes misconstrues why are beings connect with us? So scientists get a little upset when too many scientists are anthropomorphic in their thinking and their assumptions. But, for example, James Serpel once said very clearly, without anthropomorphic thinking, would we be in what he called the pet keeping business to begin with? Because if I told you, I don't know if your animal loves you, it might look like it, but I don't know, many of you would be angry with me, go, what are you, crazy? So the reality is anthropomorphic thinking is crucial. And now that we're out of the humane society, if I can say this, when you think about it, who are the animals that are most adopted? They're the animals that have infantile features because we connect more easily to them. Even older animals that have more childlike features happen to be the animals that we adopt more. I happen to be a lover of older animals. Um, I love senior animals. Um, and people always say, well, why don't you just adopt a senior rather than starting at the beginning? I actually like beginnings and endings, but what I really love, and we'll talk about that, is the middle. It's the middle that I celebrate the most, and that's why I wrote that book for children. That, that, that in fact, you can't always hold on to life, but if you hold on to the middle and remember the middle, then it makes it all the more meaningful. So, this is a slide that was from an article written by someone else that looks at the three major reasons why we look at, I think this is by Dr. Zerbel, um, the three major reasons why we, we uh, seem to have benefits from animals. Again, the anthropomorphic feeling, which we've just talked about, that the animal sometimes is perceived as this being that loves us, um, all the things we've talked about. The instrumental part of it, where we use the animals to help us in our lifestyle. You know, we, we, we have people that, 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 that use horses for their farming, for the toiling. Um, we ride horses. And then on the other hand, the passive side. The passive side, which is watching animals. Um, I went to Kenya when I was writing Afternoons with Puppy to find out why the Canadian that never had a dog fell in love. And I remember when I was younger in Mutual of Omaha, many of you remember that old show, I used to watch it and I, and I said, I can't go to Africa because that's probably where I was connected. It's funny, that chapter is actually called Follow the Yellow Brick Home. It leads to love. Because the reality is, I would all go to Africa and figure out why I loved animals. And was it because of all these beautiful creatures? The reality was, the love that I had, although I loved leopards and elephants and, and the, the love that I had were my, my guys that that came to bring me, but what wonderful feelings I had watching elephants at a water pool. I could spend, one of the things I, I didn't like when I went to, to Africa on um, some of the safari experiences is that many people really weren't there for the process, they were there for the product. It was almost like they were hunting. I got to get the shot. This way they didn't have a rifle, they had a camera. And it just bugged me because I could see a zebra and say, okay, park the car for the rest of the day, we'll just sit with one zebra and I'll spend five hours, six hours. Of course, they didn't want to do that, but one day I did because I asked the driver to take me on my own. And I just sat with one zebra. He couldn't believe it. I said, you can leave me if you want because I'm not going to leave. We're just going to spend the time with one zebra. My favorite animal in Africa was actually a dick dick. They're small little gazelles. And, and where I stayed, 
um, often the dictates came right into my campsite. And so rule was don't touch, don't feed, but just be calm. And so I would sit outside and sit on grass and I would be surrounded by dictates that were as curious about me as I was with them. But the elephants were wonderful. Um, I watched them drink water at the, at, at, at the watering hole. I've gone and seen polar bears in Churchill Falls, Canada. And I've been to um, Australia and uh, the Great Barrier Reef um, in my office. To give you an idea, we talked about the passive use, and there's been research that has shown why do dentists have fish tanks in their office? It's because it makes you relax. And National Geographic and Discovery Network has uh, made millions looking at that. The reality is we sometimes gain tremendous benefits. So my office, I at one point had I, I, I cut down one tank, I have a coral reef, very large with um, saltwater fish, and then I have a, a 60 gallon freshwater tank. I had a 90 gallon freshwater tank in another room. Um, and actually one of the things that I did with one of my clients many years ago that got me interested in saltwater was we built a saltwater tank together. That was my first experience a long, long time ago. How many of you have ever seen a film called Life is a House? Again, I feel like I'm, I'm working for Warner Brothers, but I, I, I don't. <laughs> a Life is a House was with Ken, I'm blocking the actor's name, but he had cancer and um, he wanted to connect with his son and, and they built this project together. So the, the Kevin Klein. Well, the reality is when this boy came to see me, he was chronically depressed, but he was interested in saltwater fish, and that was my hope. We'll talk about the hooks and when we get down, we'll just sit there in just a couple more minutes. The reality is, we built um, a saltwater tank. It took us a long time because I wasn't jumping into this. We talked a little bit about what fish needed, how do you build an aquarium that's going to sustain and a long period of time, and, and then we started add, building it and adding fish. By the time he finished the whole process, guess what? He was finished with therapy. Because he learned that he could be responsible enough to do this. And in fact, we worked a lot of things as we find out because I use the animals adjunctively, but the reality is he learned that he could be a giver rather than only being a taker. But watching saltwater fish, especially of a group that's very relaxing, so, just quickly, as you take a look here, America, of course, has many, many uh, animals that are left. We have more dogs um, in America than most countries. There's about 59 million dogs um, in America. Um, there are more cats, though, in America, 74 million. And that's about a 2009 statistic. Uh, there, there are newer ones. You can take a look at, uh, again, the next closest in cats would be Russia. Um, why do we love animals? And then we'll get into uh, the rest of uh, the last 45 minutes, which will be on how I use animals with people. Um, lots of theories that explain why we have this connection. I want to, for you to understand why I spent just a little bit of time when I wanted to get me comfortable and, and uh, say hello. Um, the other side to this is, is, is the reality that animal assisted therapy doesn't have a very good track record about data collection. We have better data collection on the human-animal relationship. And so there are lots of studies that look at the physiological, psychological benefits. Sort of walk through that a little bit. And so you need to understand that when you're doing the work you do, either as a volunteer or a professional, you got to be able to explain to people that this isn't just cute. You know, when I began doing this, you have to understand, I began doing this before people knew what I was doing. I, it was even before I even knew what I was doing. Because the reality is there was no books. I began doing this about three years after Boris Levinson started. But the reality is I never read his books. You know, I was a college kid. You know what I mean? I was too busy doing what college students do, behaving and going to the library. I want to make sure I said that. In this case, my students are, are watching this. But the reality is um, I figured out about the serendipitous, and we'll talk about that serendipitous discovery. So you need to have a foundation. So one of the things I like to tell people is, you know, why do you love animals? And, and so some people go through the way you're talking about it. But there are theories that explain the bond. Three of the most prominent, one is animals and social support, one is attachment theory, and then we'll talk briefly about biophilia. There are five theoretical orientations that people believe 
None, of course, have strong, strong evidence. We're going to talk about three. So what do we talk about as animals and social support? Carlos and Nicholas, they're from the United Kingdom. They basically have been doing a lot of writing on animals and social support. In my second volume of the book called The Handbook on Animal Assisted Therapy, we had a whole, we had a whole chapter by them. Again, one of the reasons why we see animals being a social support is one, pets are always perceived as being available. That kind of bugs me. And um, one of the things that I've learned over the years is um, I allow my dogs the freedom of saying no to me. Just like sometimes um, I would say not now, although I don't really like to do that because I like to live for the moment. And, and meaning that every moment that you're here today is a blessing. So enjoy what you do now. In fact, when I went to the airport yesterday, I was in Los Angeles, and there was a man talking with a business associate on the phone, and, and you know, I didn't want to be a, an eavesdropper, but um, we were all sitting around, and he was talking very loud. Hello! He was really talking very loud in the, in, in, in the airport. And, and all of a sudden, he, his, he sees a, a number flash on, and he looks at the man, and he looks at his phone and says, ah, it's just my wife, I'll call her back. And I was sitting next to a woman, and she just sort of looked at me with those eyes of disgust. And, and, and I was disgusted too, it's interesting. Because 30 years from now, if that man goes to a hospital, the business guy that's on the phone isn't the one who's going to be phoning to come visit him in the hospital. And so I learned a long time ago, enjoy the ride while you have it, appreciate the people while you have them, tell them that you appreciate them while you have them, and rather than telling them later on when you can't. So, um, Animals is being perceived as being available. I think that's good, although I think we need to give them autonomy. We'll talk about the welfare side. Um, not many social skills really are required. And I think that that's an important one, especially in the work that I do. I have children that are sometimes socially awkward, and, but they love the animals, so we help them interact with them. But my animals are forgiving if you're kind. If you're not kind, they're, they're going to back off. And one of the things that you'll hear is I train my dogs in sign language. And so they understand when I tell them to back away. I also, because sometimes I work with people that are a bit agitated, but I watch my animals very closely because they're not gimmicks. I know I'm jumping a little bit now, but I have to say this, that when I began this, I'll cheat a little bit by telling you, I'm a magician. And, and um, when I was a graduate student, uh, my ultimate goal was to try to figure out not only good therapeutic techniques, because I think I'm a good clinician, but I needed ways to make people feel comfortable with and I had a friend in graduate school whose grandfather was a wonderful magician, so he was a magician. And I remember giving a lecture once with him, and he was like a nervous wreck, was driving me crazy. And so I said, listen, I'll help you learn how to do this. Teach me two tricks. Teach me two tricks. And so he said, okay. So I got him through the speech, and it was fine. And so when I moved to Los Angeles and I became a, a licensed psychologist, um, one of the things that I wanted to work on, again, was to engage with my patients. So I did two tricks with them. But when you do two tricks with people, what do they always ask for? Do, do more. So I said, oh my God, I, I don't know anymore. <laughs> so then I called somebody at the Magic Castle in Hollywood. And I said, listen, I don't want to be a magician. I do not want to be a magician. Teach me a few more. You know, my wife was ready to wring this guy's neck because, you know, 27, 30 years later, you know, I perform magic. I've done a couple of television shows. I've some famous magicians. I run the youth portion of a convention called the International Brotherhood of Magicians, and all my boys do magic. So I do a lot of magic. Well, that's how I began using animals. I thought they'd be a cute gimmick, very much like this. And I was a sinner, but in a bad way. In fact, one of my favorite speeches, favorite article I ever wrote was called From Sinner to Be a Reformer. I'm not a sinner. But let me tell you, this is not magic. These are not gimmicks. It's a lot of work for my animals. Therefore, I spend as much time now advocating for breaks. I have kids that say, Dr. Fine, if I ever die, I want to come back as your dog. <laughs> and that's not funny. But the reality is, these beings are so well taken care of. They go to vets. They get, eat, they, they get fed really balanced meals. Their treats are carrots and cucumbers, things that don't cause them to look like me. Um, <laughs> We exercise, we give them breaks. One of the things that I do is when I work with people that I believe my animals are not being comfortable with, they don't stay. 
So, and that's something we have to talk about and again we will later on. So again, this is an important piece, but some of the children that I work with, you know, sometimes I'll do social parties as part of clinical processes. And I remember one little boy walking over to one of my dogs years ago at one of her birthday parties. Could you imagine having a birthday party for a dog? I had 65 children there. 65 children. I had graduate students, but again it was all therapeutic. This is not it was a wonderful party, and then I did a little magic show, but the reality is. What's it like when you're never invited to a birthday party? What was it like when another child ran to one of my dogs and said, you know, I love you, I never go to birthday parties, this was great. The other thing I was thrown, the first time I did a birthday party after this, we changed it, the kids brought birthday presents, which I was surprised. All of a sudden I had 65 little things there, and I went, well, I don't need this. And again, Pastor for why the escape the spring of human interaction. We talked about that. You need to realize, like in the film that I showed you, if I just go back for a second, many of you saw Lassie mm -hmm. and, and Old Yeller. Remember when the boy, that's why I made that video thing together. When you, when you talk about Lassie, right? Think about it. The little boy always went to Lassie when he was having a bad day. Elizabeth Strand, who's at the University of Tennessee mm -hmm. School of Social Work, did a wonderful study, and, and I love her work, where she talks about animals acting as a social buffer for children. Now think about it. Children um, at homes where there's domestic quarrels or if there's a divorce going on, they look at their animals as, as a buffer, as that social support. How many of you remember your childhood, if you grew up with animals, maybe you would turn to your animal if you were in a, in, in a desperate time, maybe having an argument with a brother, sister, family member, even a uh, friend. On the other hand, the attachment theory, the attachment theory really looks at the fact that many of us engage with our companion animals because of a need to be useful. Bowlby and Ainsworth were two psychologists that really looked at this work with why we are parents. I think I wrote a book called Fathers and Sons years ago, and I remember talking to my uncle, I'll never forget this, when he, when he, when, when he said this to me, he sort of threw me, I said, you know, he knew I was writing this book. I said, well, your kids are old now. They're, you know. And he said to me, you know what? It does, he calls me Bobby. He says, Bobby, listen, it doesn't matter how old your kids are. You're still the dad. It's just a new set of aggravation. That was his words. But the reality is attachment is why we do the things that we do. We feel this need. That's what we talked about, the mothering or the, the fathering. And, and, and there have been a lot of studies that have looked at the comparison. That's why when I asked him, how many of you carry pictures of your animals. When you go to a vet, you feel like you're the ambassador of that news and that, in fact, it's almost like being a pediatrician. How many of you remember going to a pediatrician's office? First thing you want to make sure is that pediatrician remembers your kid. Got to know the name of the kid. You don't scream them. You don't mess that up. It's interesting. The same thing when you go to a veterinarian. When you go to a veterinarian, you've got to make sure that veterinarian remembers that dog and, 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 and shows that connection. It, it's, that, that's the hard part about being a pediatrician. Sometimes it's probably a hard part about being a veterinarian. I, I should ask Bill that question later on. The reality is that comes from the attachment piece. On the other hand, and here we take a look at it, there's a greater attachment to pets among people who have fewer, fewer human ties. So, for example, people that are single, we see some of the psychosocial benefits. People that are divorced, people going through midlife changes, like empty nests. We, we have animals in our lives, and again, we see this, of course, with the elderly. And I actually really like it with the elderly, because, you know, when I think about this, it, it is really sad in a society where, where, where people have been active contributors. As we get older, people basically say, you don't have to do this. And I know that to the day I die, I know that I don't want anyone to tell me that I'm not useful. And that's one of the reasons why people have animals. I remember years ago, one of the jobs that I quit was at a nursing home when I was a consultant I, and I was a student there. And, and, and I remember sometimes people belittle, I don't think intentionally, the older person. And it really frustrated me because I kept on saying, not only am I thinking about that human who may be in an older body but has a soul that, that still could be very, very young. I don't want to be treated that way. For sure with the elderly, the attachment is very, very high, but with any of these populations, it's high. When you think about it, who is the population that tends to have more pets? It's families that have children below the age of 12, usually from 6 
to 12 is where this begins. My kids were blessed because they had animals all of their lives with them. The biophilia hypothesis was actually a theory that came from a gentleman named E.O. Wilson, who was a biologist, and he talked a little bit about the fact that we seem to have animals in our lives because of our innate love of nature. And again, that would explain why some of us, how many of us like to do hiking, and when we do hiking, we might see animals, and, but we see nature, and that really explains that whole process. The other side to this, of course, is how you can use biophilia in its perfect sense, because often I'll sometimes like to do therapy, not only with animals, but I do with plants, and we would take walks and we'll look at gardens, so you can combine the two together, and that's what biophilia would suggest. So, What's the role of animals in therapy? And that's one of my cockatoos. And, um, I've heard Amos Snowflake. She was an umbrella cockatoo. But this is how it all began for me. So it was about 1973. I'm not very good at math, but you, you can help me along with that. So it was about 38 years ago that this story began for me. I had no idea what I was doing. I told you I was a kid growing up in Montreal. Never had an animal in my life. But, but I got keenly interested in this. So I said, I'll get a small little guy, because I lived in an apartment with my mom. Um, I was an undergraduate student in Quebec, and, and uh, I was actually working for the Quebec Association for Children with Learning Disabilities, in case there's a little preface. Number one, I got this mouse, brought it home again, my mother's paranoid with animals. So I got this mouse, warned her I was going to do this, brought the mouse, they, in those days they would put the mouse in a little paper bag. And, I had the cage and had everything all ready. I came into the house and I was ready to prepare everything. My mother started screaming, It's a rat! Don't drop it! She made me so nervous. Really, Bill, I feel like, you know, I have to, I'm looking. She made me so nervous that I said, I, I can't do this. So I brought the mouse back. I told the guy, don't worry, I'll come back. Don't have to give me a refund, but not now. I had to work with my mother. I finally said, forget the mouse. We'll get a gerbil. And I brought some Sasha. We became fast friends. My mother sort of would wave to Sasha in the distance. But Sasha became a family member. And you know how this all began for me? I decided one Sunday to bring Sasha to one of my programs. She was going to be a show and tell because I didn't know what this was. And in fact, if you look at the history of this, people really weren't writing about animals and therapy that early in time. So I brought Sasha to the group. And there she was. In those days, the term learning disability was a very vague term. Um, the kids in my group today, I've been diagnosed with ADHD, high-functioning Asperger's, ODD, OCD, lots of challenges. But I remember one boy who, in my opinion today, I would have definitely said he had ADHD, really busy. And he said, Aubrey, can I hold that gerbil? And I promise you, I won't move. I didn't know anything. I knew that Sasha wouldn't bite. So I said, put your hands down like this, and I'm going to let her sit in your lap. And the kid didn't move. And then many of the other kids said, can I hold her? And then they said, could you bring her back? So over the course of time, Sasha became the mascot of this program. Some kids made her a habitat maze. And that was my first discovery. 